And then I usually announce you're being recorded, so you know that. <laughs> but everyone in the room knows that. Um, I am delighted that Marilyn uh, uh, suggested and offered, uh, to, wanted to come out to Malloy, and I said, I've got just the thing for you. What are you doing in May? <laughs> uh, and she agreed. But as you can see, you've had the, the description of her background. She has uh, tremendous uh, expertise. And I know when you see what she has to say, it will knock your socks off for the kind of work that she's doing. Now, I like to say proudly that when nurses do nursing research, we're not necessarily researching the medicines or the treatments. On the other hand, when you cross over into all of the precision medicine stuff, you are deeply connected to the treatment. So I'm eager to learn some of the stuff that I can only begin to understand in the oncogenomic landscape. Great. Thank you, Marilyn. Great, thank you. So thank you so much uh, for having me here. And uh, it really is an honor. Uh, uh, you were just talking about on the way over. Uh, thank you for the ride from the train. That <laughs> my uh, One of my key mentors is Chris Mysakowski, who is a, an alum here and the most highly funded nurse scientist oh, in the history of NIH with over $50 million in research funds, and she's at the top 3% of all funders. So really, like, you know, product of Malloy. Uh, so it, it really is an honor uh, to, as a mentee of hers, to be here and to uh, meet with you and to talk about some things in um, ecology, genetics, or the oncogenomic uh, landscape. So. You can use it down. That's great. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, this works. It so, gets hot behind this. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I have uh, no disclosures, and also, I'll, uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to uh, field them as we go along, or we can wait until the end. Great. So um, there's kind of three components to what I want to discuss with you today. One is to talk about implementation science in the era of precision medicine and the Moonshot Initiative and then talk a little bit about uh, the ethical conduct of research in the new omics world. And then I'll share with you some of the work I've been involved in looking at associations between glycemic status and immune function in patients with cancer. So first, uh, implementation science. Um, so what is that? Uh, the most basic uh, definition is translating research to patient care. And then more formally, it's uh, looking at methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings, but not just research, evidence-based practice as well, so the full gamut of that uh, into routine practice, and with the goal of improving quality and effectiveness of health services and care. So really, in that broad spectrum, getting down, drilling down to this precision uh, area of what we're all here for, and that's for better patient outcomes. If we look at it from the lens of the Precision Medicine Initiative, we're integrating many layers from omics, meaning genomics, uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, so the whole gamut of the omics world, um, biobehavioral, which as neuroscientists, a lot of us are involved in the biobehavioral research, environmental aspects, and other areas, really focusing on that personalized health care. And we can look at it as multiple components uh, from genomics to healthcare, looking at outcomes evaluations, providers, payers, healthcare systems. If we put it all together, we're really looking at this uh, spectrum of an ecosystem, you could say, from nucleotide summation, so from small to large. So the Precision Medicine <coughs> Initiative, how many of you are familiar with what that is? So. So it was uh, announced in uh, 2015 by President Obama, uh, and he launched this to bring us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes and to give us access to personalized information we need to keep ourselves and our families healthier. So really focusing more on um, individuals, families, systems, and importantly, wanting to have patients more involved in research. Uh, so an encouragement to have patients as part of our research studies, uh, not just as subjects, but as actually helping us to design and implement our studies. And then the other important side of this is for patients to finally have access to the findings of the research studies that they're involved in, because we historically kind of kept them separated from that. So really having that more uh, personal focused with the uh, individual. 
Uh, with this initiative, uh, new innovations in research and practice, everything from molecular levels to the behavioral, physiological, and environmental. And the proximate target for this is oncology research and translation to practice, and then uh, adding in multiple uh, conditions more distally. Hold on a second. Sure. Sure. I just wanted to have a link to it so it doesn't time out. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so with that proximal target, one year later in 2016, uh, in uh, President Obama's State of the Union address, he announced the Moonshot Initiative. And this was uh, spearheaded by and still is uh, by Vice President Biden. And the goal is to eliminate cancer as we know it. So that's a huge undertaking, but it's not a new concept. Um, in the 1970s, uh, Sidney Farber of uh, the Data Farber Cancer Institute fame, along with a very close a friend, a uh, philanthropist of his, uh, Mary Lasker, teamed up and they published these full one-page ads in many major papers around the nation, in the New York Times and in uh, the Washington Post and others, uh, with a, uh, a, a note to then President Nixon, big headline, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. And then some information under it. So uh, not a new concept. We haven't cured cancer since the 1970s. Uh, one of the reasons it's been in our uh, species uh, and other uh, uh, species for over 2 million years, which we know from a, a lot of the anthropological studies. And it's really about 200 different types of diseases. And it's really complex because it's not just one cell going abnormally wrong, but it's all of the contributors to that from the environment to our behavior. So it it's, has so many layers to it that it's really hard to eradicate it, but we're actually getting closer to that. So this was uh, set off with a billion dollars, uh, more money has been added to it, and the goal is to accomplish uh, a decade of research in half the amount of time with a number of overarching goals and prevention, a lot of targeting immunotherapy because the immune system has multiple functions, tissue repair and eliminating uh, foreign microorganisms, but another part of the immune system is to uh, detect and stop abnormally forming cells from uh, from progressing, which and when there, that system breaks down, that's how we get into cancer. Um, looking at enhanced data sharing, uh, pediatric cancer focus, and special cancer uh, research fund that was established. A blue uh, ribbon panel was established, and they came up with these uh, top 10 priority areas. And I want to just highlight this one, number six, minimize cancer treatments, debilitating side effects, which is uh, just a, another way of talking about uh, symptom science uh, or managing symptoms. This got on the table because nurse scientists were sitting on this blue ribbon panel, and that was really exciting. There, uh, different members of the Oncology Nursing Society from around the nation. And they are, a lot of them do symptom science and they know how important it is. And they were able to, um, to get this on this top 10 list. So really great to see that nurse scientists aren't just sitting at the table now, but having a really strong voice. And we're with you who are uh, new graduates or about to be a, a graduate in a few years, you will be in this uh, sphere someday sitting at these types of tables and having your strong voice and changing policy. So this sounds really exciting. Uh, but there are some challenges to this research uh, when, when we look at implementation science and that translation from research to practice. So looking at some of the goals of precision medicine moonshot initiatives, again, they're really large and complex. And then we're getting into an area of research ethics in oncology genomics that's getting quite complex. New terms are emerging like infodemiology and infobalance. Uh, a lot of challenges with health literacy, omics literacy, technology and social media, and then the uh, children and pediatric considerations. So we'll talk about some of those. So translating uh, these uh, initiatives to research, if we start talking about technology, so we were talking about technology a little bit earlier, um, different aspects, patient monitoring. So there's a lot now with telehealth, and that can be really exciting. Uh, you can have patients doing uh, direct uh, conversations with their healthcare providers through telehealth, through uh, uh, kind of Zoom meetings or kind of video conferencing. You can actually, the physician or uh, healthcare provider, advanced practice nurse can 
um, let's do a visual assessment at times. You can take a picture of something that a rash or something that's bothering you and, and have them in real time without having to go into a clinic uh, work with you online. Uh, and that's really exciting. You can also uh, do more monitoring of physiological things, blood pressure monitoring, blood sugar monitoring, where the data goes back to the healthcare provider. Uh, a lot of self-monitoring and self-managing, uh, such as symptoms, um, physical activity, nutrition. So a lot of us have uh, kind of fitness monitors that we, uh, the new Fitbits, everybody walks around with that. So we're, we're really uh, very self-focused on all of our health. But all of these things through technology are in places where other people can have access to them, uh, sometimes with better protection than others. So that starts to get into a gray area. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, there's also a lot of uh, clinical trials for new and innovative therapies, uh, gene therapy, immunotherapy, and then these combination therapies. So looking at uh, gene therapy and immunotherapy, so gene therapy is uh, in the basic sense where you can actually take a healthy uh, slice of DNA and insert it into an individual where it will either uh, override a mutated gene or replace one so that you then become uh, whatever the problem is is then overridden and you now have a more healthier outcome. So in theory that sounds really simple but if you think about the fact that uh, nuclear DNA is in every one of our nucleated cells uh, in our bodies it's quite complex but there are uh, some really great um, strides that have been made with this and some really great outcomes and the future will just bring that further and further into, uh, into being more part of our regular uh, health care. Um, immunotherapy is, again, using the immune system, particularly against uh, abnormally forming cells, to, uh, to try to trigger the immune system to better detect any cancer-forming cells and eradicate it. And there's been a lot of really uh, great accomplishments with that as well. And sometimes gene therapy is part of that, so inserting a segment of, uh, of a gene, a healthier segment of DNA to help the immune system uh, eradicate the cancer. What gene therapy is not is in this cartoon, I love <laughs> science cartoons, it's hard to read. So this is Freud talking to a gene saying, well, would you say you have a dominant or recessive personality? <laughs> <laughs> and I particularly like the uh, legs, the crossing the legs, which looks like a double strand <laughs> DNA. Yeah. So the science humor. <laughs> <laughs> So that starts to bring us into the world of research ethics. So I'm sure you all recall the tenets of ethics in medical ethics, the basic tenets of autonomy, uh, being self-informed, beneficence, uh, non-malfeasance, and justice, which is equality for all, uh, and then some add-on veracity, so making sure it's accurate and fidelity when you repeat something that it's repeatable. If we look at the Belmont Report, uh, they focus on respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. So thinking about these, um, if we look at gene therapy and immunotherapy for autonomy, thinking about the patient's choice. So is there enough information for a truly informed decision? And, uh, and does the patient know what's going to happen, whether or not they go into this uh, type of a trial? How is that going to change their quality of life? And importantly, what are their goals of quality of life? So we, as nurses, we're really good at talking to patients about you know, how this might alter your quality of life. And we're really concerned, particularly with our symptom science, is not just keeping patients alive, but keeping patients in life. So sometimes patients might want a shorter quantity of time if it's a better quality of time, rather than extending life for a very long period of time in suffering. But with some of these trials, um, that needs to be presented to them. I mean, some of these immunotherapies and gene therapies can cause severe illness, uh, and they might not survive it versus not being in that kind of a trial. And sometimes we don't even know the answers in terms of what those symptoms are going to be like. But is the patient informed enough to know how to make that kind of a decision? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Uh, are there, what are the harms? Do we know what the side effects are? And if we do know what the side effects are, are there protocols to manage the side effects well enough? And then the equal opportunity for all. So a lot of the people that are in these uh, trials are the higher socioeconomic status, uh, sometimes living more in urban areas with large healthcare facilities. So it's not equally distributed. 
Uh, and then enter social media. So uh, 2 billion people on the planet use social media, about 80% in the U.S. There are more people now using social media than the population at large uh, that lived on the planet in the year 1900. So it's, it's becoming mainstream. It's very overwhelming. And it has become a huge resource for research, um, not just research, but marketing. I'm sure you've all experienced you look at a pair of shoes and those shoes follow you for like six months, whatever uh, you look at on the internet. But again, these new terms, infodemiology, uh, evaluation of internet-based health data, and then surveillance, surveillance of internet use. And I'll show you some examples. So infodemiology, so it's like epidemiology, looking at the uh, online information. Uh, you can use this to globally track uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. And they were doing some studies looking at algorithms to track uh, kind of text and postings from different media resources and World Health Organization postings. So here, uh, we're looking at the incidence of oral cavity cancer uh, across the globe at, at different levels just by uh, using all of these different postings to figure out uh, the different levels of health over the different countries. Uh, Infobalance, surveillance, this was a really interesting study. It was published a couple of years ago. It was a joint study between Columbia University and Microsoft Research. So something you wouldn't think about a company like Microsoft partnering with a, a huge university for a healthcare study, but they did. And it was a large scale a study uh, using uh, an anonymous uh, search logs, but they looked at individuals who uh, were looking at internet searches where they kind of surmised that they were likely recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And then they took those people identified, were able to find their IP addresses because Microsoft can do that, and then they looked back at their search logs prior to what they were currently searching, and they found that they were searching for certain symptoms that seemed to be related to then what they figured were their diagnosis of pancreatic cancer because they went from symptoms to looking at different types of treatments. So they thought, well, this is a really rich opportunity. You could kind of use this, uh, this type of searching if you found somebody that was searching for these symptoms and contacted them to come in for screening, the possibility of having them diagnosed earlier for something like pancreatic cancer that's often diagnosed very late and hard to treat, and then you get them earlier treatment and better outcomes. So on the one hand, that's kind of a really uh, exciting opportunity to catch a, a difficult disease at an earlier stage. On the other side, this is how invasive is this, right, of our privacy. So where do you draw the line? And it's a gray area, and it seems to be shifting because of all of our, um, how the internet is evolving. Uh, and then enter this other layer of literacy, really difficult. So to understand uh, genetics and genomics, you need a certain level of knowledge of biology and math. And a lot of people, uh, people in our population don't have that level of knowledge. And then even some providers don't fully understand uh, everything in the genetics and genomics world. So we still have kind of a lot of catching up to do. Uh, sometimes the science is ahead of what we can educate the population at large, both in healthcare and, and the uh, consumer. Uh, and there are also still a lot of healthcare disparities in omics studies. Uh, one of the goals of Precision Medicine Initiative is to bridge this gap and to get more uh, people, uh, again, in, involved at, at all different levels. Um, how many of you heard of um, the All of Us Initiative? Yeah, okay. So that is um, actually it's launching this Sunday. Yeah. So this is it's an effort. It's a large scale uh, nationwide, actually, I think possibly global wide effort to enroll a million people into this large-scale study to sequence their genome so that we can accurately capture every population on the planet uh, genome and sequence it. And then uh, people who enroll will also get periodic um, um, different evaluations. They'll have surveys to answer. They'll have different physical exams. They'll leave uh, samples for biological evaluation, like blood, saliva, and uh, urine and stool. And, um, and it, this is going to be a long-term, ongoing thing. So it, it actually, um, it's launching uh, on Sunday. And, um, and Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, 
is going to actually be in New York for the launch. So it's um, so it's exciting, and but it's part of it kind of all is in uh, parallel to or it, it, uh, offshoot of the Precision Medicine Initiative that, uh, that in, in trying to bridge this gap and get all populations represented. Because historically, as you know, most studies have been on um, you know affluent white men. And then with other studies like breast cancer, we get a lot of uh, white women with breast cancer. Uh, and there's been a lot of disparities. So we're really trying to bridge that gap. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about social media. So aside from kind of what Microsoft and Columbia did with tracking people and finding their IP addresses, it gets even more personal because through social networks, we're daily posting our lives out there. So that's also something that anybody can take a look at. And there are researchers that track conversations. You can do qualitative analyses. Uh, you can actually do content analysis of words and phrases, try to get underlying meanings of uh, different conversations. Um, there are some limitations. So you could have multiple meetings from some of the shorthand <laughs> languages. Um, you can uh, track postings for quantitative analysis, looking at the number of views and repostings of things. Uh, you could look at it as predictors of intention. So looking at discussion groups are uh, people intending to do cancer screening. You might get a better idea of that. Uh, you can use this for background information, a needs assessment, uh, such as discussions between patients with cancer. So one of the other things they're finding out is sometimes uh, patients undergoing treatment for cancer don't want to fully report their symptoms because if their symptoms are worse enough, it's going to stop their cancer treatments. They, they're afraid that they don't want their treatments to be stopped because the alternative is not good. So they don't, uh, they might not disclose that to their uh, healthcare provider, but online they found in these discussions that patients are reporting much worse symptoms than they are reporting in the clinical office. So again, another way to find out information, but how much is that being invasive by what, kind of joining these discussion groups and tracking what people are discussing. So a lot of uh, kind of great areas in the ethic moral area as we move along with this. And then with uh, kids, so assets. Uh, parents and guardians act as a proxy, but you really want to get the ch child to agree to be uh, to partake in something. And they say that assets uh, can be as early as age seven. Um, and ideally, you present the information to the child and the family uh, and do it over several sessions to make sure that he or she really understands what they're getting into. Um, and it, it's great when the child and parents are on the same page, but when they're not, then that becomes uh, kind of an issue. Um, a lot of facilities will not enroll a patient unless the child actually agrees to it, even if the parent wants the child to be there. Right, so now I'm going to segue into uh, talking about uh, in oncology, looking at how blood sugar impacts immune function in patients with cancer. And since we're kind of switching topics, is there any questions or anything you want to, uh, any burning questions before we go on and we can save the discussion for? We're excited right now, so I'm going to just ask. Okay, okay. right. <laughs> the um, uh, pediatric person that I am and, and Marcia as well, but um, one of the things that is, is in, the, in the literature in relation to who's in the, who's got the best interest of the child, yeah. uh, the parent or the caregivers, and there are a couple of cases in, in the UK. We, were, we put together a panel um, for ENRS that didn't get accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, but uh, whoever was on the committee. But it was to discuss just that, is when it's, di when it's a conflict. And I guess my question to you would be, it's a binary thing, and it's not a oh then everybody's hat. They're not. Well, it's mm -hmm. in whose best interest, and when it's binary, where does the researcher um, stand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a great. Uh, you've point. written on. Um, Marilyn mm -hmm. has written on the um, consent issues, mm -hmm. so I know she can tackle this. Yeah, so it is, it's a hard one. So it depends on, uh, and most answers start off with the defense. It depends. <laughs> um, so if it's, uh, if, if there's an issue where it's a type of a, a clinical trial where there, it's a last ditch effort for survival, uh, then usually it's going to be, it happens to be in, in the research world, 
and if the child doesn't want to be a part of it, but the parent does or vice versa, it often would be overridden so that the child receives the therapy or gets into the research study. If it's something that's not as uh, life uh, on the edge, then again, the highest recommendation for most places, most facilities go with the child's wishes. Uh, if the child uh, wants to be in it though and the parents don't want it, sometimes the child won't be put in it. But if the, uh, if the uh, child, if the parents really want the child in the study and the child really refuses, then usually they, they won't uh, force the child to be a part of it. More to come. So that's more good. to come. Good yeah. Stuff. And um, and the other thing is, so with the side plug for ENRS. Uh, so we're uh, they're going to be doing uh, webinars. So that, that would be a perfect <gasps> webinar oh. if you're uh, open to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. was, I mean, uh, what's interesting is like there was a little bit of a, a series of studies I, from one of the children's hospitals in the UK. I don't remember which one it was. It was a couple of years ago. It was a really interesting study where they asked kids how is best to entertain the idea of participating in studies. Mm -hmm. They ask them. That's because great. you know when you think about like the parent centered, the patient centered, mm -hmm. you know, our world, we're not really used to doing that mm -hmm. in the United States to thinking, you know, like looking from the standpoint of the child, right. you know, and uh, we always, you know, our the guiding principles are, you know, that right to an open future and, you know, the child's best interest and so forth. But we're kind of like here going at the child. And it was a really interesting couple of articles on how they were, this one children's hospital was really developing the approaches to having children participate in studies by asking them how they wanted to have the them have them explain to them what kind of information would be useful at you know at various ages. It was just kind of an interesting, different take on the idea of uh, that yeah, piece of it. Yeah, definitely. That'll be good. Yeah. We should do some. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's we don't tend to do those kinds of things. <laughs> no, even in our children's good. hospitals in the United States, which of course are very, very child centered. Right. Right? We don't tend to extend it. We think extend it in the practice arena, but don't always extend it out into right. You exactly. know, the trials. And stuff. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's. I mean, it fits exactly with the precision medicine goal. So mm -hmm. engaging patients. Mm -hmm. So. You know, kids are yeah. patients too, asking them what they want, how they want, and how they want to be approached. That's mm -hmm. excellent. It'd be great to study. You know, I'm actually, it's interesting because I see that the stick of two ends because when we talk about patients should be well informed yeah. prior to agreeing to anything, and especially as children. And if it's a trial and the researchers or the healthcare professionals don't always know all the possible outcomes, yeah. then you're not really well informed because so there's true. just the unknown part that it's just not yet, yeah. you know. Exactly. Realize so it's almost like yes we want to give them information and if they're children and we're not able to give that to adults how can we give it to children how do we make that decision mm -hmm. or let the child make the decision if the adults are having a hard time because they just don't know the outcome yet. exactly and so that's very difficult yeah, yeah and that is the information you provide is that you don't have all of the answers yeah, sure. you don't have all of the information right. particularly with the first and human trials those are really scary yeah. I, oh, sorry. I just have a question and this because I don't know are there competency tools for to work with children to make those decisions? You know how when you have a patient and people say, well, he doesn't understand, and there yeah. we, ha we have the ability to test their competency. Are there age-appropriate competency tools for that purpose for it, children? So I don't work with pediatric populations, but I'll ask the experts. So I know that Marion Broom was yeah. one who had done the, the informed consent and, and brought the age down to seven. I know she was involved with that. I think we have one of her uh, webinar things that we mm -hmm. recorded. I don't know if there are specific measures of saying that you can make. I mean, what was parents say they're too young. They're too they young to understand. Yeah. You can show right. it. They do. I don't Is know there that a, there a are more measures. objective way to identify that. Well, I mean, you know, there are plenty of developmental tools of yeah, one sort or yeah, another yeah. that can be used to, you know, that. assess a Age child's, appropriate you know, cognitive reading level um, understanding and those kinds of things. And I think that when you have, when it is, you know, when you have those conflicts between, you know, among the researcher, the clinician, the parent, the child, mm -hmm. um, people tend to do more of that, you know, to really examine the child's level of mm -hmm. understanding. And make sure that um, uh, it's appropriate. A lot of kids who are chronically ill 
you know, have a, a more advanced context mm -hmm. of understanding, right? Because you know they've been in the you know they've been in the healthcare system in a way that your typical six or seven year old hasn't been. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, when when I think when there are those kind of conflictual situations, people pay a lot of attention to those things. And I mean, so many studies show that you know parents really view, especially oncology clinical trials, as treatment and not as research. Mm -hmm. And they will do any, you know, for the most part, they will do whatever to push towards the treatment, you know, and do it to a large degree. And there's just, that's out in the pediatric literature over and over and over again about that. I'll check in too with Marion to see, because I can ask her and that would inform you since you're doing that work as well. Perfect. Thank you. I think one of the other things when you look at the literature of the burden to the parents mm -hmm. because they're recognizing that they're making decisions um, yeah. and that is very that you know if you look at some of the literature and I know that from my own experience because all of my oncology experience was with pediatrics yeah. and mm -hmm. the, the burden that they feel of making these decisions um, because they know ultimately it's not impacting their health, but the health of their children, and that those children will carry those decisions with them should they survive for you know for a long time. So, you know, or when they see the child really suffering from the effects, I mean, it, it is you know that's a whole other area that needs to be explored is the, the amount of burden on the parents. I mean, I did like a, making about those a year and a half ago, I did a review of the literature on sort of parents' responses to. Um, having to make some of the deep ethical decisions, and it wasn't only oncology, it was a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, neonatal ICU mm -hmm. and those kinds of things, but, um, you know, the, the burden kind of goes both ways, because the burden was really about feeling bypassed in the system, and that's what happens, not so much about the clinical trials, but it's just mm -hmm. about the decision making yeah. in general. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I mean, there isn't very much literature on it, you know, it's hard to kind of... Like I said, some of it I just saw from my own yeah. you know, experience, yeah. 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 yes, in neonatal, but also in this yeah. particular yeah. population. I mean, this is definitely not my area of expertise, so, you know, the oncology, but I do know, you know, some of that, the questions about engaging kids in research is kind of an yeah. interesting question. And it is, and we need to do more. We need to do more. I think that's what everyone's saying. We need a better understanding of what does that mean to be, you know, if you start at seven, what does that mean? Exactly. Yeah. There was a famous uh, case where um, parents with uh, great resources, they had a child with Panconi's anemia, and one of the best treatments for that is a uh, bone marrow transplant, and you need a matched donor. They didn't have a matched donor. So then they decided to do um, to have a second child to donate cord blood to do it, mm -hmm. and they did pre-implantation testing to genetically make sure it was a good match, and in the end, it, they, so they had the second baby, and it worked, and the older child was fine. But so many ethical issues with that. Like, you know, who, the, the child uh, who received the transplant, you know, how much say did she have in it? So what about people that don't have that level of resources because it wasn't going to be covered by insurance? Mm -hmm. And then the whole ethical issue of, of doing the pre-implantation uh, testing and, you know, specifically selecting the right uh, egg for that. So, uh, you know, a lot in that world. And again, you know, where is the voice of the child in that? I mean, and that, kind of, that got played out into a novel that became yeah. a movie, right? Yeah. 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 I never yeah. saw that. I always yeah. forget. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Good yeah. 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 Can I do one other question, too? Because I don't know the answer to this at all, but there's a new, at least ads on TV, of uh, some legislation of right to try. Yeah. Is right mm -hmm. to try related to clinical trials? And is it, uh, do you know if it, it has that connection? The part that I'm not sure about, because I haven't looked it up, um, is it the paying for being in a clinical trial or? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm going to try and do that connection because yeah. that no. I think that Thanks it was just this morning that I heard. Yeah, right. I heard it, and it looks like it's bipartisan, mm -hmm. but it also sounded to me because I'm, you know, I've also done this work of false hopes and. Yeah. And and making it into a, a piece of legislation. I think it's a bill. I'm not sure how far it got. Yeah. But I'll let you know on that too. Okay. Good. <laughs> we got lots to, to play with. <laughs> a lot. So now I'm going to segue into another area with uh, looking at blood sugar uh, and immune function of patients with cancer. And I'll try not to kill you with all of the physiology <laughs> too much, but I'm just going to give you a, a very quick 
overview of looking at cellular metabolism in a healthy cell versus a cancer cell and with blood sugar. So in a normal cell, you have a molecule of glucose goes through the uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle using what's called an um, oxidative phosphorylation pathway, and you get these 32 to 36 molecules of adenosine triphosphate, or cellular energy, per glucose, and then it also produces a certain level of something called reactive oxygen species, which, which regulates uh, kind of cellular growth and metabolism. In a cancer cell, the uh, a molecule of glucose uses a different pathway. It's called aerobic glycolysis, uh, first described by a researcher named Warburg. So, of course, you get your name on that when you describe something new. It follows a lactate dehydrogenase pathway, and it only produces two ATP per glucose molecule. So, if you think that's really inefficient, why would cancer cells kind of segue to that pathway? But their payoff is that it creates a hypoxia inducible factor, one alpha, which actually promotes angiogenesis and different pathways, which actually helps the uh, cancer cells to escape that immune detection so that it progresses. So just kind of keeping these pathways in mind, uh, one of the things uh, we started to look at was um, what happens to normal healthy cells in a patient with cancer as with uh, levels of blood glucose. Um, so we know that there's a number of contributors to adverse outcomes in patients undergoing a treatment for cancer from the cancer itself, the treatments, and then with that immunosuppression. So we've been looking at um, abnormal blood sugar, which we defined as or, or termed malglycemia, meaning hyper, hypo, or increased fluctuations, increased variability. Really importantly, with or without patients with pre existing diabetes. Um, and there's certainly other contributing factors uh, that we're starting to know a little bit more about older age, higher BMI, stress, infections, nutritional imbalances. Um, there's a number of risks for these abnormal blood sugar levels, again, with or without diabetes. When we look at older age, it's really um, looking at cellular aging, the process of cellular senescence or immunosenescence for immune cells, and then different pathways with nutritional imbalances that actually promote aging cells. Um, as well as uh, a higher body mass indice, which leads to a state of something called obesity inflammation, where we get this high expression of these uh, inflammatory markers, which are signaling molecules. And then stress and treatments, we have steroids, uh, which can increase blood sugar, uh, and then an inflammatory response from infections. So if patients have infections, it can promote hyperglycemia, and if you have hyperglycemia, learning how much it can interfere with immune function, and that increases the risk for infection. So it's kind of a cycle. So uh, looking at some of the outcomes from this, uh, which with infections can lead to sepsis and death, uh, mortality unrelated to the cancer or infections, and then in that symptom area, the poor quality of life. Uh, and we think, again, that linking pathway is inflammation. So at some point, we might coin the term glucoformation or glucose-induced inflammation, but we're not quite there yet. So just hammer, hammer <laughs> glucoformation. <Hammer -based. laughs> <laughs> Trying to give you a little bit of background information again without too much of the, the uh, physiology or mechanisms. Um, but this is our uh, pathway that uh, con it's our conceptual model that keeps evolving every time we conduct a study and you get more information. Um, just to give you the larger view of it, if you have somebody with hyperglycemia, you have an intracellular cascade, and then through different pathways, you get these increased risks for infections and death. And then the other pathway shows the death unrelated to infections. And then on the right, you can see the symptoms. And we particularly look at this cluster of fatigue, pain, depression, and sleep disturbance. Um, and then just to kind of show you on a cellular level, so we talked about um, earlier the, uh, the cancer cell versus a normal cell. So here's a normal healthy leukocyte in a patient with cancer. And what happens is, so here's the mitochondria, then you have that normal glucose going through the TCA cycle, you get your ATP. With hyperglycemia, one of the things that occurs is you get a condition of superoxide broken down by the enzyme superoxide dismutase, but that leads to hydrogen peroxide. That dissociates into water and oxygen, which is fine, except that creates 
really high levels of that reactive oxygen species and that produces oxidative stress to this cell. In another pathway, you have with this huge cascade of intracellular calcium, which fragments the mitochondria and also promotes these high levels of ROS and oxidative stress. That triggers nuclear transcription factors to then produce an overexpression of these signaling molecules. That, so this is our inflammatory pathway. Now, normally, these signaling molecules, if you have something that happens, a, a tissue injury, there's an infection present, you want these expressed because their job is to solicit other immune cells to come and take care of the problem. Uh, and again, also, you want the immune cells to detect abnormally forming cells. But with the overexpression, what happens is it actually starts to impair the immune system. So you have decreased immune function, even though you have this, uh, this high expression of these uh, signaling molecules, and it kind of perpetuates itself. So mm -hmm. then just a little bit of background information. Uh, and uh, in a, now I'm going to switch to the clinical side uh, of things and how I kind of got into this area. Um, so as most of us do, working as, uh, on the clinical side of things, I was an oncology nurse. And I noticed a lot of uh, patients, I happened to be working with uh, different patients, with uh, adults with acute myeloid leukemia, uh, receiving chemotherapy treatment. Uh, one of them had diabetes uh, prior to the cancer diagnosis, the others did not. They all had really high levels of blood sugar and they were having terrible infections and some of the patients started dying from the infections. So I started asking the oncologist, do you think there's some connection between the blood sugar and you know, these infections? And they said, oh, no, the you know, chemotherapy is uh, destroying the immune system. They're immunosuppressed. That's why they get the infections. And they get steroids. That's why their blood sugar is high. So I still thought it felt like you know, our gut feelings as nurses, something's going on. So I then uh, went to, grad the, uh, went to do my graduate program at the University of Washington in Seattle which is the picture on the right, and uh, talked to some of the faculty members there, and one of them uh, who became my mentor at the time, uh, Donna Berry, she sent me down to speak to a doc at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and it was uh, Michael Book, who's a physician, uh, one of those MD, PhD uh, people. Uh, I was thrilled that here I am, this graduate nurse, and he's going to speak with me. We had a really nice conversation. He said, you know, that's an interesting question. We've been, uh, we talked about that before. We've never investigated. Let's uh, kind of work together on it. And he then introduced me to um, Corey Casper, who's an infectious disease doc, and a whole group of us came together and they uh, worked with me here as a nursing graduate student and we started to answer the question. Um, this picture on the right is the University of Washington and this is the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center with a taller building is their clinic, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And in the background, which is actually 100 miles away, although it looks the really out. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah look to see if the mountain's <laughs> out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when, on a clear day in Seattle. So this is Mount Rainier. And the statisticians at the Hutch love to show this picture because if you look at the, uh, the shape of it, it's a perfect <laughs> distribution curve, right? So it's, it's, the statisticians love it. So and a really great place to do a graduate work and fun. Um, so what we found was we looked at um, 1,175 patients who had received allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation, so a donor from somebody else, uh, for their treatment for hematologic malignancies, and then we looked at blood sugar. And we used the, uh, we, we didn't know when their blood sugars uh, were taken, so we used the uh, definition of random blood glucose, which is hyperglycemic at a level of 126 milligrams per deciliter, that's the ADA guidelines. And then we looked at here from the day of transplant, day zero, through 100 days post-transplant and looked at mean blood sugar. So the first thing we see is that all patients were hyperglycemic. But the ones with infections had much higher levels of blood sugar compared to those without infections. So that was kind of our first, okay, so what we're seeing, there is some connection there. And then we did a Cox proportional hazard model to look at the risk for this. And we saw that uh, the solid line is the, uh, the hazard ratio, and then the dotted line is the 95% confidence interval. So we first see that as blood sugar goes up, it does increase the risk for infections. It doesn't get worse as blood sugar gets higher. And in fact, if we look at the hypoglycemic level, it looks like being hypoglycemic is almost protective against infections. 
But we don't want to kind of stop there and get excited and say, oh, we should keep patients hypoglycemic because it'll prevent them from getting infections. So if we look at the next cubic spline, we see for mortality that the higher the blood sugar, the worse the increased risk for uh, death, as well as as blood sugar gets lower, the worse the increased risk for death. So here, I always thought it was linear. I thought immunosuppression from the blood sugar, kind of a worse state of immunosuppression, infections, infection-related death. But here we're seeing a whole other layer of, of what turns out to be organ dysfunction from these abnormal blood sugar levels. So infections are really bad. They can lead to sepsis and death. But independent of that, blood sugar can really impact the increased risk for death. And then we found it even more so with variability. The more blood sugar uh, fluctuates, the worse you know, the increased risk for death. So, so you're saying organ, dis organ death yeah. or organ dysfunction, mm -hmm. and these are um, these are blood-related uh, cancers than the right. spleen or pancreas? Yeah. Oh, so you mean for the solid tumor? Yeah, solid tumor. Yeah, so if it was a solid tumor as well, we don't know enough, but the same uh, thing I would guess would be the same patterns. Most of this uh, research on the mechanisms have been in the uh, liquid tumors. But uh, we did some work, and uh, that's a great question. Okay. But it, those are the organs. So it, liver, the organs that would be kidneys, balanced, liver, yeah, the, kidneys, um, spleen, and exactly, pancreas. Exactly, yeah. And this is damage from chemotherapy, you're talking about? Or dysfunction from, from, from the disease? Yeah, from so the this disease is, or from the treatment? This is, so during, um, so they, uh, it's a combination of treatments. They get the stem cell transplant. Prior to the transplant, they have to be, they get high doses of chemotherapy to become immunosuppressive that they transplant as a nice uh, environment uh, in order to uh, to graft it. So it's like, so with these transplants, it's a kind of opposite a solid organ donor. You're actually getting a donor immune system. So you get these new uh, cells, healthy cells, uh, stem and progenitor cells, and they uh, then you graft and you have a healthy immune system. If it's a foreign uh, donor, so not self, which would be autologous, the allogeneic, you can get what's called graft versus host disease, where the immune system looks at the whole body as foreign and attacks it. So, so you, you know, looked at all of them. Act. You looked at all of them when you looked at blood sugars. You looked at all types of transplants. Yeah. So this was just allogeneic. Um, so the next study I'll show you is the autologous. Uh, so um, and actually segue to the autologous study. So this was um, so I left uh, Washington, finished up my doctoral studies, and became a faculty member at NYU, and was. Um, uh, funded from an NIR and a, a K23 grant and was able to then prospectively uh, now enroll patients. We use the auto, so self-transplant group, and collect blood samples this time. Uh, and they were also, uh, during hospitalization, we had morning daily fasting blood sugar levels. So a level of hyperglycemia for this group is 100 milligrams per deciliter or higher. We also excluded patients with pre-existing diabetes to have a more homogenous sample to really kind of see what's going on. So here we looked at, um, uh, so this is 100 milligrams per deciliter. We looked at a pre-transplant, minus 10 days to 30 days post-transplant, and then particularly looking at that two weeks of early post-transplant, uh, we see blood sugar levels not as high as the allo group, and this was a much smaller sample, but we get the exact same pattern. So higher levels of blood sugar in those with infections compared to without. So here we are, two sides of the country, two different groups of patients, and the same pattern, same pattern. following transplant. So that was a kind of a, you know, you always nice to repeat your findings kind of in a different way. Uh, we also did a Cox proportional hazards model, and again, we found the increased risk of some just really focused on infections with blood sugar levels that were higher. The other thing that you know, we did with our uh, collecting the blood samples, so this time we looked at cytokine expression in these uh, subjects. All of the cytokine uh, work we did in our model was based on what we knew from the literature, which was mostly in the diabetes literature. So here we are in, in with patients with cancer trying to see, you know, is what we're hypothesizing happening really happening? So we know already that the patients with higher uh, blood sugar levels are the ones with infections. If we look at what we plotted out here, um, so this is the vertical line is day zero, that's the day of transplant. Again, we looked pre-transplant to post-transplant. 
The um, top box is IL-6, interleukin-6, one of the inflammatory cytokines. So again, when this is expressed, and we want it expressed if there's an infection, it should then solicit more white blood cells. And we plotted it over time across white blood cells. And the uh, solid lines are patients with infection, dotted line patients without. So what we found was, indeed, there was an increase in the IL-6 with the patients with infection. And again, they have the higher blood sugar levels. But look what happens following it. They're not getting that response that we, you want with the, uh, with the cytokines. So the cytokines are being expressed, but the immune system was not functioning, was not triggering that hematopoietic process. So patients with infections had lower white blood cells, even though they had the higher signaling molecules compared to patients without infection. So it was another kind of little proof of our hypothesis in our model that what we see is going on is really going on. But again, it's smaller sample size. Uh, this was uh, 56 patients, and we need to do this on a much larger scale and look more at mechanisms. Uh, and then we, uh, at Mount Sinai, we uh, did a medical record review um, looking at um, 400 patient records pre-transplant, uh, doing latent class analysis to see, look at post-transplant outcomes. And what we found was three groups of patients. So here we included patients with diabetes. We knew who they were, though, and those were all the patients on the top there, group three. And they remained kind of uh, stable with this high blood glucose level throughout. Group one was a, a low level, and then group two fluctuated. Uh, we found the patients with group two, which were mostly patients not diagnosed with diabetes, they had higher blood sugar levels, they fluctuated more, and these were the patients that had a statistically significantly higher level of infections, uh, particularly a pneumonia, and then longer hospital length of stay with that. So, uh, you know, interesting kind of uh, revealing a group that we wouldn't normally be targeted because normally you would uh, look at the patients with diabetes. And in fact, we think that's why they did better. They were followed by endocrinology and they stayed hyperglycemic, but at a lower level and they kind of stayed without uh, fluctuating. So the variability might be a greater risk factor than staying hyper. How big a sample were you able to get with uh, so health this, records? Yes, yeah, so 400. 400. Yeah, well, so that was pretty good. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then uh, I mentioned Chris Mysakowski and her colleagues, so they do a lot of work with symptom clusters. Um, so we uh, partnered with them uh, to be a study site, this is so back in the uh, NYU days, and, um, and we uh, helped them with, with one of their symptom studies. So they've uh, looked at how different symptoms do cluster together, and again, particularly looking at pain, fatigue, depression, and sleep disturbance. They also found that patients' level of symptoms seem to cluster too. So a lot of patients are either in this um, kind of all low group, an intermediate group, or an all high group. And we did a, a genomic analysis uh, with them to try to tease out what's going on underneath that puts somebody in a different group. Um, and then one of my uh, graduate students, uh, Faye Wright, was uh, very interested in uh, fatigue. So she put her uh, dissertation study, she made it part of this, and really looked at uh, the fatigue levels and looked at some uh, genetic markers and really found with two markers, this is very interesting, uh, with two mutations, uh, one was uh, a worse outcome with symptoms and the other one was actually protective with the mutation, specifically in the area of uh, markers of inflammation, so inflammatory markers. Uh, so here we have a symptom associated with inflammatory marker uh, in a patients, these, this patient sample was a solid tumor cancers. Uh, we haven't paired that with glucose data, but it would be really interesting to start putting these pieces together. But we did in fact then add a glycemic substudy to this study. Uh, we measured a glycosylated hemoglobin A1C at uh, enrollment and then just compared them at the one time point for how they uh, kind of self-reported symptoms at that time point. Uh, and then we um, put them into categories based on their A1C as either normal, pre-diabetes, or diabetes. And we found that the patients with higher blood sugar levels, not surprising, had higher, higher body mass indices, had more comorbidities, were more tended to be more smokers and exercise less. So that was not unexpected, but just to see what our sample looked like. Uh, and then for the symptoms, the ones with higher blood sugar had worse physical functioning, psychological functioning, social functioning, and worse uh, total quality of life. 
are really interesting that the ones with higher blood sugar had better spiritual functioning, or whatever that means. So, mm -hmm. say if there's anybody interested in that area, we have some data for okay. data to further look at. And that sample uh, was um, just over 200 patients. Uh, and then just recently completed uh, an exercise study um, because we've done a lot of investigations and we're getting more pieces of the puzzle, but we have to start doing interventions. So we had, uh, we this time took uh, patients with solid tumor cancers um, and we took their uh, hemoglobin A1C at enrollment and six months uh, following their uh, treatment. Uh, and we gave them actigraphs to wear at two time points and had them keep daily exercise logs. And then they answered symptom surveys at enrollment months three and months six. And what we have found at our first glance of looking at the data was that the a group that was in a prescribed uh, walking program had their A1C actually decrease over six months. So even with all of the cancer therapies, to see that we were able to control it uh, and even have a decrease was really exciting. And they also reported a lower pain, depression, fatigue, sleep disturbance, and higher energy compared to the control group. So another piece of the puzzle unfolding that we can maybe regulate blood sugar with, um, with exercise. So next studies, uh, in a few weeks, we're submitting a, a large grant that's going to look at host behavioral and treatment factors that influence the trajectories of blood sugar in uh, patients uh, undergoing autologous uh, stem cell transplant partnering with, between Mount Sinai and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And then uh, also with uh, Chris and her colleagues who do really complex statistical analyses uh, as a part of this, and we're excited uh, to get that out the door and hopefully funded. Um, and then uh, getting back to those pathways, looking at the metabolic predictors of cancer outcomes, uh, working with uh, Dr. Eckhart, who you know, and, uh, and uh, Jan Breslow from uh, Rockefeller. Um, and then we also need to start doing some more of these integrative omics studies for symptoms and outcomes. Uh, and then again, more on the intervention studies that, so that eventually we put all the pieces of the puzzle together. We can predict prior to uh, cancer uh, treatment who's going to do worse with these glycemic uh, outcomes. And then we can do tailored interventions to better control their blood sugar so that they have better outcomes. Um, eventually, much larger picture would be what can we do in life to prevent people from becoming patients with cancer? But, you know, it's one step at a time. So that's the, always the overarching goal. But a number of, of implications for research and practice, we go back to the uh, precision medicine moonshot initiatives. If we look at immunotherapies, uh, so there's a lot in immunotherapy, but if we have something like blood sugar that's impacting the immune system, immunotherapies might not work as well. So kind of partnering in that area to help the immune system uh, function optimally by controlling blood sugar so that the immunotherapies can work better. And then we do, again, need to uh, target these diverse populations. Uh, in practice, uh, it's not a uh, surprise, but really uh, from what we've learned, it's so important to really uh, monitor a patient's blood glucose, even if they don't have a diagnosis of diabetes, if they have a high BMI, those with older age, um, and then recommendations so far to tolerance, exercise, of course, smoking cessation. Um, starting to look at diets, the ingredients in the Mediterranean diet are probably the best and most anti-inflammatory, and then uh, stress control, which we didn't talk about. But the, we, uh, it, it's all part of the, <laughs> the scope. It's, it's I want to learn about that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but again, nurse scientists do have an important voice in this. Um, everybody from every level can uh, work in this area from research to practice. We do have to look at those ethical considerations. And um, there's some resources here. And also, I think I sent ahead this uh, Calzone article, which has some uh, information. And, uh, and I like I always like this quote from uh, Nelson Mandela, when you reach the peak of a mountain, you realize there are many more mountains to climb. So <laughs> in research, right. every time you answer a research question, there's at least 10 more that pop up. <laughs> <laughs> and they find it very humbling. So, just some references. Yeah. Thank you. Hold on. Okay, thanks, buddy. If we have a video, then it, it'll now be dialogue. So okay, this yeah. would kind of mark the end of it. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Yeah, it's a open to questions. And great to I'm curious about all the cancer patients with low BMIs. Yeah. So how do they do? Yeah. Is it because is is there 
Did you look at the nutritional status as well? Because a low BMI and a low a poor nutritional status yeah. is also going to affect your immune system. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So that's a, a great question. So in our next study, one of the um, things we're looking at really closely is nutrition. And there's this uh, nutrition tool that NCI has online where you can uh, track it and you can do it anytime. You um, put in everything, it's a 24 hour recall. You put in everything you consumed within that 24 hours and they really question you. They drill down to uh, portion size and the brand of a product if you eat a granola bar or something. And then it uh, gives you, it automate, automatically gives you all of the nutritional contents, the macro, micronutrients and calories. And then that you can use, they have, they link you to where you can uh, calculate out a healthy eating index score. And based on that, you can try to figure out uh, where you are. So, um, so adding that in is going to be really important because if you are too low of a BMI, um, you can trigger, and certainly if you're having uh, cancer symptoms and problems and nausea and vomiting, um, you can get into a pattern or a pathway of cachexia. And that also is really bad uh, for your immune system, increased risk for infections on many levels because then you start breaking down your uh, protective mucosal barrier and infections can then translocate. Mm -hmm. So um, to doing a microbiome study would be helpful in, in that area. So yes, it is, uh, we have, um, in one of the studies, I had one patient underweight that ran into a problem, uh, and then a lot, uh, some that were normal weight seemed to do the best, and then when she gets to a level of 25, uh, uh, BMI of 25 or higher, that seems to be kind of the triggering point from what we know so far, but we haven't delved into that far enough. But so, yeah, great question. I mean, from clinical practice, I've worked with kids who were severely malnourished. Yeah. And they get overwhelming infections yeah. of common everyday. It, yeah. it has to be nutritionally related. Yeah, it is. It's so the normal flora transmigrates mm -hmm. because they're so undernourished. So yeah, it it, it really does impact uh, the uh, the immune system at, at all levels, like from our physical barriers to the functioning of the cells. Mm -hmm. And the cell function is different than what you described. For hyperglycemia, with, yeah. And we hyperglycemia, because yeah. this would be a hypoglycemia. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so That's what but I was you still, about. you actually, some of the patterns actually overlap, so you still get the mitochondrial fragmentation from it, and it destroys the cell. Uh, so you're, you're also impairing the response from the immune system, but for a different reason. So instead of too many inflammatory cytokines, you just have this uh, destruction mm -hmm. of the cells. Yeah. So really great. As we age, our telomeres shorten, yeah, and then we become more susceptible to different diseases. Mm -hmm. Is there any research or studies to stop that process? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I know it's not the fountain of youth, but but no. to maybe alter, yeah. So actually, know, the destruction of the telomeres. There was a summit at NIH a few years ago. It was on aging, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of gerontologists were there, and they're exactly targeting, you know, the telomeres. How do you stop them from shortening? Yeah. And th there's a uh, great researcher, Judy Campisi. Uh, she was at Berkeley, and she moved, she might be at the Planck Institute now, but she really uh, focused on this. If you want to look at her work, and they do have some strategies for this. And their prediction is that they really should be able to get people to live to about age 130. Mm -hmm. That raises them, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so you then, do you want to live to 130? So, yeah, so they, they are working on that. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting, there's a group in Ohio that were uh, from the other end of life. They were looking at, they were studying telomeres from placenta uh, tissue, mm -hmm. right, from the newborns, and they actually found ethnic racial differences in the telomere length from the newborns. Right. That, wow. the, uh, that white people actually have the shortest telomeres that mm -hmm. you're born with for some yeah. reason. So but then I think breastfeeding yeah, changes they that. Could change, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so really interesting. That's so, so would you recommend to my doctoral student the NIH um, summer yeah. genetics yeah. Yeah. camp? Yeah. Oh, I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, so NIH has different things. So the Summer Genetics uh, Institute, has, it's in June, 
us. It's for a month. It's fantastic. We learn a lot about genetics and genomics. It's a classroom and then also a lot of lab time. Mm -hmm. So, which is really fun. They walk you through steps and you uh, heard of Henrietta Lacks, the yes. HeLa cells. Yes. You play with HeLa cells. It's really fun. Um, and then the other thing, if uh, and that's hard, it's competitive. All of their programs are competitive to get into. Mm -hmm. They don't charge you for it. You just have to pay for your um, kind of travel and sure. living. But um, they also have the week-long uh, OVIX uh, boot camp, which usually is in either late July or early August. And that's a week-long uh, session to look at big data and OVIX sciences. And that, so those are really, you know, I highly recommend okay. all the NIH. <laughs> I needed I needed the, I needed the extra so. Yeah, yeah. That's so, uh, the, yeah, definitely. I would. Uh, I mean, they, they have their class. Uh, I think everything is full for this year, but for next year, so she got time. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> okay. uh, look at it. Yeah, because okay. I think uh, usually they open the application process around February or March. Yeah. Can I ask an ethical oh, question too? Okay. Um, they have all these Ancestry.com and uh, yes, 23andMe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who actually owns that data once it's submitted? Because I know I did it. Yeah, you know, but um, do they own all of my DNA, <laughs> or is it mine? I mean, are they yeah. allowed to research it? And yeah, so so that's uh, one of the problems with these commercialized things, especially that company. They were shut down for a while. Oh, because um, they, twenty three and me. Yeah, twenty three and me, which is now paired with Ancestry dot com. Um, so the um, they were shut down because they were giving back results without the resources of a genetic counselor right. to, uh, you know, or, or geneticist, you know, or, or referrals to treatment or, you know, for screening if you came up with something yeah, they, bad. They warn you. They said, you know, you may not want to open yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, so now you they know, warn so. you. From a policy standpoint, ANA has a new uh, policy statement. Yeah. You know. The uh, new, new, it's brand new. It's yeah. June, it's, um, 2018 April, I think, policy statement, which is kind of rare for ANA, um, or is it the account? I think it's ANA, um, has a policy statement trying to make clear that these companies don't have the scientific, they, they don't make mm -hmm. uh, transparent the scientific yeah. resources either. So it's not, it's not an, it's an education, ANA will do an education kind of that the public needs to be educated about these mm -hmm. things, but I'll try and find that announcement and send that to you right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's other, um, probably came from my song. It probably, yeah, so, but there's other layers to it. So one is that the, um, it costs them more to run the analysis than you pay for the kit, mm -hmm. right? It costs them way more. So how they make their money is they, pool your data and they resell it to researchers oh. and there's like three million consents that you signed to do it who nobody reads them but it's exactly you, know, you are Henrietta Lacks yeah you are <laughs> pretty much Henrietta Lacks uh, yeah so you know it's it can be interesting uh, the other thing is the um, CLIA certified labs I'm guessing they use CLIA certified labs but if um, uh, it's still an evolving science the CLIA labs are the ones that the federal government has proven that have the integrity and ability to give you accurate results, but even those aren't 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. And if you take different labs, even CLIA labs, they'll come up with different results. So it's not 100% accurate science yet, so in its mm -hmm. nascent. Mm -hmm. So you always have to think about that. I did the Children's, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Genetics course in the second Oh, yeah, yeah that's a great course. Ago. Yeah. Oh, it was hard. <laughs> it was hard, yeah. <laughs> well, didn't you like, it was like 18 weeks long and a long Yeah, yeah. many years ago. Wow. Well, well, we but my understanding that was that when 23andMe restarted again, mm -hmm. it had FDA approval. It does now, okay. yeah. Yeah, it does. So it probably has Clea Lab. Yeah. Because right. disclosure, and we worked on one of your students. Um, Alyssa Forrest has a paper out on disclosure and disclosure from research results. The researcher is obligated to disclose results, right. but their results from a research lab are not CLIA certified. So mm -hmm. it's a yeah. dilemma in mm -hmm. that, that ethics camp, and she had written about that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, this, this will date me, but in 2003, I I uh, testified for iSong. Don't ask me how I got asked to do it. I got to read the script, basically, yeah. but then I got asked questions. I testified in the uh, Bush uh, Commission 
on ethics in society, mm. uh, which was I was it was part of I had I was at IOM at the time I guess, but someone asked me because I wasn't tied to government myself, I could make these statements and the arguments about CLIO, CLIO certified, not CLIO certified, who can even give results, mm -hmm. um, was really interesting. And what they said then, which is 2003, is if you're going to scrape the inside of your mouth, send it off to find out what cosmetic to use, that's an FTC issue. It becomes a, it's not only a health yeah. and disclosure, but it's a federal trade commission issue. Mm -hmm. And when they brought that up in 2003, everybody kind of went, <laughs> right. uh, fast forward yeah. know, 10 years later and now it's it's it crosses over from being a company that owns your data yeah. <laughs> to uh, a health sort of issues uh, yeah. it's really fascinating stuff I it really is. value this because it's just so difficult to keep up with this. It, is, it, is, yeah. it changes all the time it does yeah mm -hmm. it, it, so thank you yes, so yeah, thank you but yes. uh, there, there's still so much we don't know and there's new information every day so yeah. so again I highly recommend going to these NIH courses because they really get on top of everything but you know the public thinks immunotherapy is here and it's going to save me I know mm -hmm. because yeah. of all the commercials they do, yeah again I, FTC it crosses into that um, a completely different area I love uh, your your consent stuff I mean that that's yeah. stuff mm -hmm. that really gets into yeah, what people need to be able to understand. Yeah, exactly. And that's a, the other uh, kind of, uh, I think, false information of what people believe in is with gene therapy too, that, oh, you know, I can, if I'm sick, I'll get, I'll just insert a new gene and I'm going to just be healthy and, you know, I can, mm -hmm. so I can live a really bad lifestyle because they'll just fix me. So yeah. it just doesn't work yeah. that way. And the same mm -hmm. with immunotherapies. And, uh, I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. Mm -hmm. but again, there's this whole much larger ethical issue. So if we can cure all of these diseases and prevent them and live mm -hmm. to 130 our planet, <laughs> what can make your whole you know, the integrity of the world. And going back to the ethics thing, I'm combining your presentation with yesterday's and uh, cybersecurity. And, oh. you know, there's so much online and so many of these support groups and everything yeah. online. It's such an easy, vulnerable group mm -hmm. for people who have fake therapies yeah. and oh, um, it, I, I, that's I, I could see as mm -hmm. such a potential area of abuse. Mm -hmm. Epidemiology and yeah. info. Yeah, that, was, info yeah. Yeah. that was very interesting when you were talking about the difference between what's reported to the clinician and what's posted. Yeah. Because you see that like in, oh, yeah. in in the parent advocacy groups, mm -hmm. you know, all different kinds of conditions that, you know, you go in, how's it going? Everything's fine. Thank you very much. And then posting, you know, here are the experiments that I'm doing with my own child. These yeah. are the therapies that I'm using. I don't really tell anybody about yeah. because I don't want to be judged. So, I mean, that is, mm -hmm. it's very interesting to think about on the clinical side what we believe we're being informed about, you know, how you track that yeah. and what that may mean in terms of, you know, the evidence for practice versus what is your you know, people are really yeah, doing. Exactly. Even like yeah, years ago in my dissertation, that came out where. You know, the parents were sort of saying, well, I did a little study on, you know, medically fragile children after they were discharged mm -hmm. home. And the parents were saying, well, yeah, I'm doing all this kind of like experimenting to see how long can my child stay off of oxygen? Is my kid really ready to be off the feeding tube? Wow. And, you know, they may or may not have disclosed it, or they would do it after the fact. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I know, you know, Sam is ready to to for X because actually I've already done it. But but I think that it you know now it's public. They they were just disclosing it yeah. as part of the narrative. But now it's kind of public. And how mm -hmm. you know and the other thing that was you were talking about, I was kind of thinking about how like I use this um, data analysis program Atlas. Yeah. And you know an Atlas can do all these interesting things with all kinds of different you know PDFs and and that in when I first started using it maybe it was like 2001 and there's all this functionality. I'm like, what am I going to use this for? No one's doing any of this kind of stuff now. Everybody is analyzing all these different chat rooms, postings, yeah. blogs. It's all, there's so much out there. And I don't even know what that means in terms of, you know, how public, how free are you to do those kinds of analyses? You know, to yeah. go in there and say, hmm, let me see. Well, you the have Russians can do it. The Russians can do it. <laughs> 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 
I won't take any credit. As Keith said yesterday, the North Koreans, I went, oh, wow, he knows that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was just amazed at what he knew to get at what. But so but, many yeah. patients are afraid to tell other treatments that they're using because yeah. they think they'll get thrown off trials. Yeah, yeah. So the bed too. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a great yeah. point. Well, I think that's the point. That, you know, you're going to be afraid you're going to be judged or yeah. people are going to think you're. Yeah, yeah. but sure. the problem yeah. is, that, I mean, a lot of these um, complementary and alternative yes. therapies, they're not benign, so they can interact with yeah. yeah. other meds. Uh -huh. It really is important. Yes, there's right. still tons right. of people yeah. running down to Mexico for treatments yeah. in these yeah. different clinics. By the way, is there um, more integration now in cancer care with um, non-traditional medicine? Because I know in some countries it's actually side by side. Oh, yeah. So I I don't know how it's uh, there perceived. Are, there's different pockets where they do a lot of integrative medicine mm -hmm. integrative health care. And uh, people have some really good results. Mm -hmm. There's Yeah, there's a group in Seattle that does it. Um, I know there's huge institutes in China that do mm -hmm. a lot of the, there's different herbal therapies, but they, they do make sure it's safe that they don't have an adverse interaction with chemotherapies. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing, people think that uh, like chemotherapy is all these synthesized chemicals, but um, some of the most potent ones, uh, taxane, is directly from the bark of the tree. Uh -huh, so, yeah. you know, in terms of natural Catholic health, it would look like some natural therapy. And <laughs> it's really toxic. Yeah. You were talking, like you were talking about the symptom science. Like this is way out of my wheelhouse, but you might know. But I mean, there's a lot of symptom science studies about managing symptoms in adults. Is there like a is there a lot of focus in children on the symptom clusters? I was kind of, when you were talking about obesity, I mean, I was just thinking about, you know, it's not in the newspaper anymore, but there's still an enormous obesity problem in children and yeah. teenagers and certain, you know, um, you know, in certain cultural groups, when yeah. you see higher levels of obesity and so forth, and how that kind of overlaps into yeah. some of the work that you're doing, where you were doing adults, but right. you know, five years before that is the 16-year-old kid yeah. with a similar kind of mm -hmm. disorder, you know, who has leukemia or another kind of cancer. Yeah, so th that is another area. Uh, symptoms in uh, kids, especially the younger they are, their cells turn over so fast, so their nausea and vomiting is really bad for them. Which mm -hmm. works. So they oh, yeah. oftentimes focus oh, yes. on that. They can get into the hypoglycemic and cachexia yeah. pathways. Yeah. Uh, but you're right with now the adolescent obesity and all its you know, they're, they're almost, uh, they get these like early adult bodies and, yes. uh, and have the same. They have the same, all yeah. the same, you know, yeah. type 2 diabetes, and, 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 and then some type 2 diabetes, diabetes and obesity, and obesity and 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 child and cancer survivors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that too. Yeah. So, you know, so that, how is that yeah. going to, yeah, that's interesting. besides having yeah. had treatments earlier in life, you know, right, and that exposure to all those chemicals, you know, and now yes. they cause a, uh, Shorter stature, and you know they just have you know, higher incidence of higher BMIs as they go into adulthood. As as survivors, you know they have exactly. passed yeah. their yeah. five year point. Mm -hmm. Plus higher risks for all. There's mm -hmm. a lot of high risks too. Yeah. So. What do you see as the biggest? Biggest gap between the evidence and practice. Oh, great question. Right <laughs> so uh, I don't think we have uncovered enough evidence to know how to best. Uh, treat patients or how to best manage them at this point. Uh, I think there's still too many unanswered questions. Um, like we don't know what the therapeutic range of blood sugar should be in somebody undergoing treatment for cancer. There's some kind of anecdotal evidence that it should be a really low level of hyperglycemia, but the, the best evidence is that just keep them out of the fluctuations uh, and it's very hard to manage. Uh, so uh, to having enough information to create tailored treatments, knowing how somebody's likely to do, I think is the biggest challenge. Are you guys that. hearing how you answer that as a scientist? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, indirectly. <Which> great. <laughs> yeah, you answer it in that way of, of yeah. you don't go beyond the data that you know, which is the Dr. Pete yeah. motto to everyone. But uh, thank you for the great example. Yeah, but I mean, I wish I had a better answer. So, you know, from translation to practice in this area, um, it's, um, you know, I think it's really, it's education. Uh, I remember being at one conference showing a poster and a physician came up to me and said, you know, if my patient wants to eat, I don't care what he or she eats. If they want ice cream, I'll tell them to eat two scoops. I don't care about their blood sugar as long as they're, you know, willing to yeah. eat something. 
because they're so sick. Right. And, uh, you know, to me, I was like, oh, that's, you know, why, why are we, you know, uh, kind of uh, suggesting things that we could potentially then have such a really bad sequelae to it. Mm -hmm. um, but that, yeah, that's a really, um, that, that's a big question. <laughs> It's a great question. And, uh, One of the things I, I like to, to kind of bring this to to an end. Um, I like I love when our guests come, and especially when they don't live that far away. And I love to uh, sort of stimulate the idea for my clinician friends and my my new students and my graduated students and my colleagues is that we have opportunity. I mean, the stuff that Marilyn and I are sitting on that puts us in the possibilities of connecting. We have opportunities when you're crafting, those of you who are new at it, mm -hmm. when you're crafting your questions, those of you who are seasoned at it but need to know about partners, that's the kind of thing we're trying to stimulate here. And by by uh, having, again, I'm grateful Marilyn would come and talk to us, but um, knowing that that's in our reach, um, talk to me if there's something that you're particularly interested in. And, and uh, I love that you had a good time. It wasn't hard getting out here. No, it was yeah, very it was easy. easy. Yeah. So please join me in saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I heard that might have other questions. I heard that you like that. Might mean that I went off. So really? I heard it's only, you know, it's to make it stimulate more time for us to actually do this. <laughs> <laughs>